Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So what you are looking at on the screen here is two different types of mushroom. The one on the left in Czech is called bedlar or parasol in English and the one on right is called Klosek or slimy yellow bleat. Doesn't sound so too, too good, does it? It's actually not the finest type of bleat. But anyway, um, these mushrooms I picked about 10 kilometers from where I live. And uh, as people may know, there is some claims that mushrooms in Eastern Europe aggregated some of the fallout from Chernobyl. And, you know, I never knew whether that was the case. And so I was interested to find out. And so I have these and I exposed the radio code for about five and a half hours uh, to these to see if indeed that was true. And what we would want to find in here are isotopes that could not possibly be naturally occurring in the environment. And one of the most uh, important isotopes that comes out, which is biotoxic uh, from uh, these kind of uh, nuclear fission processes is cesium-137 uh, and also strontium-90, yttrium-90 and also cobalt-60. So anyway, I decided I was going to uh, get some data using an Android device and so here is the Android device and in addition to that um, I've also um, had the radio code over here looking at the Lion 4 reactor for the best part of uh, a day and we're going to look at that uh, data live in fact that's what you see on the screen here now okay so we're going to run through the Android uh, software here uh, it's really rather powerful so what you can see here is the micro sieverts real-time calculation here and I think it's updating every two seconds or something uh, and here is the counts per second so this is the actual dose from the energy spectrum summed uh, equivalent radioactive dose and the accuracy uh, because of the time it's been running is around about 10 percent so um, that's good or well, that might be the uh, variability between upper and lower bounds and you can see down here uh, it's got 167 all the way up to 274 so uh, that midline there I, I guess is uh, what you're seeing here, this 212. Um, okay, so uh, it's got, it, it, it's very powerful actually. It shows the battery level here of the uh, ready code. I'll zoom into that maybe. Uh, we can see that a little bit clearer. So we've got the battery level, and this has been, as I say, running for more than a day on its initial charge, and it's used about 9%. Now it claims that it will operate for up to 500 hours. Um, this would imply that it would operate for about uh, 10 days, I guess, so that's 240 hours. It might be that you can switch off the LED that I got blinking there and switch off the Bluetooth and that might operate for longer. You can see the Bluetooth uh, level there and you can also see that it's got GPS tracking uh, on and the GPS obviously comes from your phone. It has temperature here. I don't know whether that's in the device, but uh, it's interesting if that's stored. Uh, at the effective dose here over this period, uh, it says here in two days um, since it was initiated, uh, is 12.2 microsieverts. And uh, down here you've got uh, sort of alarm levels. You can't see it because I've not I'm zoomed in a little bit too much. So uh, down here on the right, you've got it, it's in the green zone, so we shouldn't be worrying about that. Uh, I think you can probably set uh, this yellow line and the red line and in fact if you put it up to the red line you can have the device beep and even the mirrors uh, the beeps mirrored on your phone and uh, you can also have it um, uh, make a vibration as well so you can turn one or other of those off. Okay so we're going to look at the settings now the settings are pretty much similar to what is uh, you can see on the PC. So you've got uh, the width of the window for averaging operational data when displaying on graphs. So 0 to 30 seconds, it's set to 8. Uh, you've got a view to look on the uh, count rate is logarithmic, linear or square root. The y-axis is by visible area uh, or cross entire, entire range. Um, the dose rate uh, here is logarithmic, square root or linear and so forth. So you've got all these different parameters here. Uh, graph settings, it has more graph settings here, you can set, set the line thickness and, and, and so forth. Um, 
and it has disabled scaling and shifting of graphs along the y's y-axis okay so um, I'm just going to cancel that because we don't want to change anything there and then also you have uh, parameters up here for the device like turning the power on and off turning the sound on and off so we'll, we'll try that so there you are you can hear it okay and if we turn the particle clicks off I guess that means that it's only going to be showing uh, warnings. So uh, you don't get all the clicks, but you'll get um, warning sounds. Okay, so we'll turn that off. And vibration. Yeah, the vibration works when there's a, there's, when there's a problem, uh, i.e. you've got too much radiation. And I can turn the LEDs off, and uh, maybe I can show both at the same time. So uh, we turn the LED off. I'm going to move that over there. I'll turn the LEDs back on, and uh, in theory it will work. Um, yes, the LEDs back on there. I'll turn it off again. Yeah. So let's turn the LED off. So you could probably minimize the amount of energy it's using by turning off the sound, uh, turning off the vibration, and uh, turning off the LEDs. But I, I like to have the LEDs on it. Uh, at some indication without some annoying clicking going on in the background. Okay, so um, that is those. Uh, and it also has this thing down here, find the device. So I haven't clicked on that, but I imagine that might uh, cause it to make a noise. Let's have a listen. Oh, <laughs> that's, it both vibrated and did a specific noise. So there we go. That helps find the, the device. That's quite cool, isn't it? Um, uh, you can put that in your handbag and it, it serves as a, those that have handbags, uh, <laughs> and it would serve as a locator. Okay, so uh, it also has a log here, which uh, you can see in the PC software as well, which shows uh, particular events going on. And uh, you can turn off different things like um, the time and uh, location data and so forth. Um, so that's that's that. Now it also has the spectrum, obviously, which is useful. And I've got it zoomed in at the moment, so uh, you can zoom out like that. So that is the overall spectrum you're seeing there. And when you do zoom in, um, it uh, if I zoom in like this and then I scroll, it auto scales the uh, vertical axis so you can see things. Now the other th thing that you can see is as I'm moving around, there are these pink lines and, and so forth appearing. So if I go here, uh, where is it? Over here, maybe. I go like here, for instance. Okay. Um, you can see that uh, it has the potassium 40 line here. So up here, it's got potassium 40. So it's identified that. And you have this amplification here. So you can kind of like amplify uh, the upper signal uh, uh, intensity. I was told by Alan Goldwater that he looked at it with his um, using a cobalt 60 and a uh, cesium-137 check source that he has and it was good at finding uh, the low energy uh, peak uh, for the um, the uh, cesium-137 and the peak for co cobalt 60 so um, so anyway so we're gonna go and um, zoom in here and you look what we go here I'll just turn that dial down the I don't need the amplification okay so this is the potassium 40 line so either in the lion reactor because uh, this has been running for 21.05 hours here and uh, that's been in this position on the lion 4 reactor and um, it has observed this potassium uh, 40 line um, but if we go back here um, if there was any cobalt 60, we would see something here. And there's z literally zero on this 13362 uh, line. And uh, there's, there's something coming up here, but nothing of any real significance. Okay, uh, so I can pretty much safely conclude that uh, the environment uh, immediately surrounding the detector here for the last 21 hours plus uh, has no cobalt 60 and cobalt 60 has a short half-life. I think it's a uh, five point something years So um, it shouldn't naturally be about in the environment, which is a good thing uh, because of its beta and it was the preferred source for uh, Alexander Parkamov in his 
uh, device that detected uh, the effect of both relic and uh, synthesized cold neutrinos in his book, uh, which we've referred to in the past, Space Earth Human. So he actually used that as the target because it is a dense uh, beta isotope with a easy determined energy, uh, this 1.328 uh, and this uh, uh, 1.171 uh, uh, we'll mega electron volts and uh, this 1.328. Uh, mega electron volts and the good thing about this 1.328 is it, it doesn't actually have any kind of other things that you normally see in the environment around it it's quite far away before you get to the 1.454 um, or sort of 1.551 or whatever it is of the potassium 40 lines this 1.46 it's got here uh, which is 1.431 kV anyway uh, my point being is it doesn't appear that we are seeing any at cobalt 60 here and if you go and um, we look at maybe zooming out a bit and we look at some of these other apparent peaks here so there's no real cobalt 60 there um, and this one kind of here um, which we're seeing is uh, bismuth 214 and it's uh, 609 kV bracket 599 kV and this is from the radon 226 radon 222 uh, decay when you want to store something uh, you can go here and you can go save spectrum to library. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to call this uh, Lion 4. Uh, Lion. Uh, 4. Okay, done. And I'm not going to set that as background. I'm just going to go OK. Now we can actually go into the library and we can see that we've got a Lion 4 here that we've just saved and this, it records the a calibration uh, that you had and so what I have here in the calibration here is the defaults that it came with if I had some check sources I could adjust those defaults uh, um, to be more accurate but anyway it's what we're working with at the moment now the one below you see is mushrooms and this was the one that I took as you can see for five hours and 18 minutes yesterday and uh, this is to see if we're seeing anything interesting. Now, at first glance, you can actually see it's a little bit noisier, and that would almost certainly be because it is um, uh, a shorter sampling time. But let's go and have a look at that. So I can go uh, upload to view here, and now we can see that this is in the view mode. So you can actually go and review previous data and analyze it later. In fact, you can export it to uh, XML or CSV, comma, or uh, tab separated or something like that. Um, anyway, so it looks, if you look, not much different uh, to the, the um, spectrum we uh, observed yesterday. But there seems to be some higher levels down here. And we've got one amplification and one filter. And we've got one amplification and one filter here. So we, I'm going to zoom into this. And we're going to go along here. And uh, maybe I've got a little bit too zoomed. Okay, so here, again, we have this potassium uh, um, 40 line. So we have the potassium 40. Um, but you'll notice that there is this. So if I click here, we can see that with this uncalibrated setup, around you, you have something that's a little bit more like a peak on the cobalt 60, 1173118 2 kV line but you also have this one on the 1332 1328 kV line that's very interesting because that would imply that these yummy tasty mushrooms that I love and enjoy and eat lots of actually has some cobalt 60 in it and the thing about cobalt 60 is because of its five year half life it shouldn't naturally occur in the environment. In fact, what it is, is when neutrons interact with iron in a nuclear reactor, they produce cobalt-60. So it would appear that here in Eastern Czech Republic, there is some level of um, contamination of mushrooms with cobalt-60. Am I worried about it? No. Why? Because if I'm eating bananas or eating coconuts or particularly anything with a lot of potassium in it, I'm going to be getting higher energy uh, uh, 
and, uh, photons or uh, beta particles or whatever, or, or lots of radiation from that. And overall, uh, it's not a large uh, um, proportion of the energy that uh, I would receive on a daily basis. But does it exist? Is, is the rumor that uh, mushrooms in Eastern Europe have uh, captured some uh, cobalt-60 or some radionuclides from Chernobyl? I would say yes. And this is, you know, I, I bought it with an interest in my own safety. And uh, this is somewhere where I can tangibly see um, that it, it actually observes something which has been claimed to have occurred. So just to, just to go have a look back, I can go to the spectrum of the current live spectrum here. And we'll zoom in and we'll go again to this kind of area where you get this uh, potassium 40. OK, so here it is. I think that's the potassium 40 line and here is the um the uh, zoom in again that's the potassium 40 this is where you should see this cobalt 60 okay so it's, it's fairly flat uh, on that peak and then we have like a, a trough there's there's no signal there as it were if we go here you still got the potassium uh, 40 there Th this is lower uh, of course it's a, a, a shorter um, sampling time only five hours and 20 minutes but it definitely has no trough here it definitely has uh, uh, a signal going up to the uh, 1328 of cobalt 60 and also it's got a peak around the cobalt 60 1332 line so you can see immediately you are seeing practical analysis with this now the question is um cesium-137 has an even um, longer half-life of around about 30.17 years or whatever it is. And so does uh, strontium-90, which is about uh, 29-point-something years. So are we seeing any, any of that? So the cesium-137 line is supposed to be here. Um, uh, where is it? Cesium. I just saw it. <laughs> uh, someone's... Okay, so this is the 662 of cesium-137. Is there something else? Lutetium, lead, radium, radium, uh, mericium, barium, barium-137. Okay, is there anything there? I don't see anything. And the cesium-137 line here. Iodine-131, well, that's not going to be hanging around for long. Um, that's why you take iodine tablets, by the way, if there's a nuclear holocaust to saturate your thyroid with iodine that's non-radioactive. Okay, so somewhere here, cesium-137. Okay, so we are on our mushrooms here, and I don't see any particular peak, at least on that uh, cesium-137 line. And let's go and see if we see anything on the lion reactor. I don't expect we will. Cesium-137, I don't think there's anything there on the Cesium-137 line, no. So um, it would appear that um, we have this Cobalt-60 um, line in our uh, data from our mushrooms uh, here from about 10 kilometers away from me here in the Eastern Czech Republic. So that is it. Thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video. Happy radiation hunting.